Welcome back to Ideas at Work and Beyond. We have Al Robinson. He's the uh, author and creator of uh, Hat City Blogs. And Al, you had some questions as well. Yeah, um, I want to talk about something that I think is a great thing that's happening in the state right now, which is the um, public financing of campaigns. Um, I know this year is the first year where we have the new campaign laws into effect. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that and how it helps out challengers um, go against these incumbents and put some more of a more even lay, uh, more even playing field. That's absolutely true, and it's actually a, an issue that I worked very hard on uh, back in 2005 when it was passed. Uh, I was working with a group called Democracy for America, uh, a, a grassroots uh, community group, and we teamed up with uh, Common Cause and uh, the Citizens uh, Connecticut Citizens Action Group and a bunch of other groups around the state to push for campaign finance reform because we felt that um, what had happened in the rolling years was directly tied to, the, to money sloshing around in politics from special interests. And we wanted to get the money of special interests out and get public financing in because it was already being used in two states in the country, in Maine and in Arizona, and we felt that it was very successful. And I think it's the wave of the future. So uh, very fortunately, Governor Rell uh, supported that uh, wholeheartedly. Um, right, and if I'm correct, the other two states were by either a referendum or by the courts. That's right. We are the first and only state to have passed uh, public financing of elections in the state legislature. And th I think the state legislature was, in, was pushed to do it because of the problems that we'd had. So what's happening this year, it's if this is the first year for it, and it's um, right now for state senators and state representatives. In 2010, it'll also be for the governor and for all of the other constitutional officers. Um, but what it does is you, you, uh, it, it makes it open. It opens up the field for people to run. Um, I only needed to raise $15,000. Uh, I had to get 300 contributions from people who live in the seven towns in the district um, and $15,000 altogether. And once I made that threshold, then the state will match, actually more than match, they'll, they'll provide uh, $85,000 more and there'll be a budget of $100,000 to run. So mm -hmm. I'm, using, no, no I'm using public financing. Uh, my opponent is using public financing. Tony is, although I think she voted against it uh, in the state legislature. Uh, but it passed because there was bipartisan support for this. Um, and when, in that case, it was bipartisan, meaning the governor, because there weren't a lot of Republicans who supported it. It was primarily coming from the Democrats. Um, and we're seeing, I just saw some numbers today, and uh, it, this is initial stages, and it's going to take a few years for it to really take effect because people still don't quite understand it. But we are seeing fewer unchallenged seats right. this year. In other I, words, more people are running than ran in the past. I think Judith Friedman, um, if I'm correct, the, in the past five elections, she was only challenged, I think, twice. Exactly. Right, and it really evens out the playing field. Exactly. And I, yes. I, th I think that's a great thing, and I, and I think it's also great that you both have the same amount of money, and no one person can't outraise the other one, and it, it, makes, right. it, it makes it... And you know, even. I finished my fundraising um, over a month ago, and that means that from here on out, all I need to do is to focus on the voters and on mm. talking about the issues, finding out what people think, and, and telling them what I'd like to do. I don't have to raise another nickel. I don't have another campaign contribution. There's no special interest money in. I don't have any PAC money. Uh, individual contributions are now limited to $100 as opposed to $250. Um, and anyone who gave $5 or more gets counted in the, in the campaign finance system for, for when, you, when you go to qualify. So it, it really did open up the system, and I think it's a great system. The only rub with this whole thing is that the taxpayers now are paying for your bumper stickers, your lawn signs, uh, your campaign. You know, I think the taxpayers are getting a fabulous deal. Because really? Because they do. get to see you, they get no, to see because they, stickers, No, you not because they get to see me, obviously. Okay. I'm joking. What they get to do, though, is to save millions of dollars that were going into contracts that were, were put out in shady circumstances. If you think about why did John Rowland go to jail? Because he was giving out contracts to his friends and they were doing favors for him back. That has to stop. And we're taking... Can't that just stop because you just don't do that or you well, go to jail? Well, you would think so. 
Yeah. You'd like to think so, uh -huh. but apparently it wasn't enough. And we've and John Roll is not the only guy. We, you know, we had problems in in the cities in Bridgeport. We've had problems uh -huh. in Waterbury. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We've had yeah. problems all over with people. Wherever there's money, people are tempted right. to steal. And, and I don't if know you about take the money out. It 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 reduces that temptation a lot. Yeah. I mean, as a taxpayer. I feel a lot more comfortable knowing that lobbyists and PACs cannot contribute to your campaign because if you have a lobbyist contribute to your campaign, they want something in return. That's right. And that's always been a problem in that's Connecticut. Right. So um, you and, use and, my money. And when I go and talk to an organization about whether they want to support me, I'm not looking for a check. Right. I am looking for their support. I'll go and talk to somebody and I'll say, I'd like to have you support me, but what I need is for someone who will make phone calls, who will go door to door, who will write letters to their friends. The, the, what we think of as traditional campaigning as opposed to simply writing a check and trying to buy influence. That's, that's going away. It's not gone. And there will always be influence in politics and there will always be money around. We know that. But this is a huge step forward and I think the people of Connecticut are getting a great bargain. Um, would you agree with these statistics that Connecticut lost 17,000 people? Does that sound right? Yeah. The, is Connecticut the highest taxed state in the union? You know, I've heard that number, and I think what that comes from is the fact that we're one of the richest states in the union. If you look at the marginal I'm tax about rates, percentages, no, not per capita. No, marginal tax rates. We are not amongst the highest in the in the in the nation. Okay, it's just the, the, it, it, the we certainly pay more in taxes because we have more money, especially here in Fairfield County. Mm -hmm. But marginal tax rates. Everybody here knows somebody moved here from New York because property taxes are lower here than they are there. Used to be. They yeah, still are. Well, they still well, are. That, that, well, it's uh, up to you, Marty, to keep them low. We're trying. <laughs> we're, we're trying. We're absolutely trying. Did you have another question? Um, now, I know we, we talked a lot about issues that are happening in Ridgefield, but your, your district covers New Canaan, Ridgefield, uh, Reading, Westport, Weston, and uh, Wilton. What are you hearing in your travels to those areas? What are people telling you are their concerns? Well, I think one of the major concerns that's coming out is health care, affordable health care. And the situation here in this part of the state is, I think, unique. There are a lot of people out there like me who used to work for one of the major corporations. I think you mentioned earlier uh, that I was a vice president at Chase. And when I was working at Chase, I had a great benefits package. And, and you know, health care wasn't a problem for me or my family. When I decided to leave Chase, one of the decisions I had to make was, what are we going to do about health care? And there are thousands of people here in this district who used to work for large companies and who have moved out onto their own and they're now uh, doing web development or they're doing marketing or they're doing consulting or they're doing all kinds of things, but they're doing it on their own and they're having to find their own health care. Or they're sitting there looking, they're, wait, they're working for a large company and they're worried. I, I, I met a woman in Reading a couple months ago we were talking about property taxes, mm -hmm. and she was concerned about the valuation on her house and how it was unfairly valued versus her neighbor next door that had the same kind of house. And she was, in a, she was you know, talking about this with the town government. Mm -hmm. She says, you know, we really have to get this down because we might have to sell our house, and if my house taxes are higher than the person next door, then I won't be able to sell it so easily. I said, oh, are you thinking about moving? She said, no, but my husband might lose his job. He works for a large company, and nobody's safe these days. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know that woman's situation. But I do know that there are a lot of people out there who are very concerned. You know, the economic situation in this country right now is, a, is up in the air. Mm -hmm. And if you're thinking about, what if I'm out of work for six months? What am I going to do? Where am I going to find the money to pay for health care? If I lose the health care, what am I going to do? Now, there was a proposal, a bill that was passed in the state legislature this past session. Right. Uh, I think it was called the Health Care Partnership mm -hmm. Act. And it said, let's open up the same health care system that the state employees have today mm -hmm. and make it available to municipalities like Rudy's, uh, to nonprofit organizations, and to small businesses, companies with fewer than 50 people, down to one person. You could be a one person small business. And the idea was to say, okay, here's how much the state pays for this kind of coverage. If you want to pay the same amount of money that the state pays, you can join that pool. Now, why is that important? Well, I worked in financial services and banking and in insurance, and I can tell you that the more people you have in an insurance pool, the lower the costs are going to be across the pool because you're spreading the risk. It's the basic tenet of insurance, spreading the risk. So we have today 
about 200,000 people working for the state government or who are dependents of people who work in the state government who are covered by health care from the state and they have a very good deal. They have a, they have a, a full benefit plan. It's expensive, but it's, it's extensive. It covers everything that you would want to cover. If someone wanted to buy into that plan, that was what this health care bill was about. Um, unfortunately, Governor Rell vetoed it. In her veto message, she says, well, this sounds like a good idea, but we haven't thought about it enough, so I want to work with the state legislature next year to, to see what we can do to pass this bill to fix it. Okay. Um, I thought it was a pretty good bill. There are 24 states today which allow the municipalities to buy into the state government plan. And there was some work done here that said that maybe we could save $1,000 per employee at the municipal level on health care. Now, Rudy, how many people work for the government in... in uh, about 175 full-time. Yeah, count teachers as well. Well, then you kick it up by about 400, Marty. Yeah. Approximately. Yeah. So... Board of Education is the largest employer. Yeah, right? exactly. Right. So, so let's say 600, 700 people altogether are, mm -hmm. on, are on the government payroll okay. of some sort. So if you saved a thousand bucks per employee, mm -hmm. you could save $600,000 off the tax rolls. Now, what would that have done for your property tax increase? That would have helped a lot. That would have helped a lot. Okay, Mr. Harwell, you, what you're proposing here is that if, if the governor had passed this bill or had signed off, had signed the bill, right? It would have saved everyone a thousand bucks on their health insurance. I'm saying that and everything it, would have been roses. I'm saying that it had that possibility. Yes, it was a voluntary system, uh -huh. so that the municipality, so Reading and Richfield, could look at this and say, "Do we want to do this or yeah. not?" And if it makes sense economically, sign us up. And if it doesn't make sense. Are you, are you ultimately in favor of a state-run uh, health insurance program? You know, health care is such a huge issue in this country. Yeah. And it's, I think, going to be a central issue in the presidential race. Yeah. And I am a supporter of a universal health care system. I think it should be done at the federal level, not at the state level. So you're going to have the federal government run the health care system? The federal government does a great job with Medicare today. I think they could do a similar job with the, with the rest of the health care system. If you think about it, through Medicare and through the veterans uh, already who are on health care, mm -hmm. this federal government is already running more than 25% of the health care system in this country today. And I think they do a good job. The VA administration does a great job with most of its hospitals. And Medicare, I think, has, has been a fabulous program for older people. We need to find a way to insure everyone. We are the only major industrial country in the world that doesn't have universal health care. And right now, there's $1,500 of health care costs in every car that GM tries to sell. And guess what? They're not competitive. So Yeah, there's a, they, it, they spend more money for health care costs in a car than they spend on steel. Exactly, car, exactly. Does that make sense to you? No, it doesn't make sense to okay. me, but I'm a little frightened when the same people that run the DMV are all of a sudden going to take over my health insurance. You know, when I, I go to the DMV, I, I go into the DMV gritting my teeth and I come out smiling. These guys give me in and out <laughs> in a short time. I have yeah. never had a bad experience in the DMV. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. I, I think the DMV does pretty well. Yeah. Well, I it's could it be better. I'm sure. I started my day in in uh, in Canada. My wife's from Canada. We have family up there. Right. And um, I've had a front row seat to some of the shortcomings of uh, of government run health care programs because inevitably they get down to rationing uh, services and and uh, it's it's not very impressive. We ration, there, there more we ration care today just based on how much money you have. If you have money, you can get great health care in this country. If you don't, you can't. And I I met a woman a couple of months ago. She and her husband and, uh, have a small business, mm -hmm. and their uh, daughter, who has uh, grown, was included. They had three people. They went out. They're paying $30,000 a year for health care. That's after-tax dollars. One family. One family of uh -huh. three people. Now, she said, we have the best health care possible. Yeah. The two of them were in their 60s. Their daughter was in the 30s. Um, I, don't, they, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, he's going to go on Medicare very soon because he's going to be 65 so they'll change but this couple now I agree that these guys are paying a lot more than everybody else yeah. but you shouldn't have to pay but this, this universal health care would be uh, not a voluntary system you would have to pay if you didn't pay your health insurance premium the government would be able to come in and let's, let's be very clear here Marty the mm -hmm. system that I'm talking about that the governor vetoed yeah 
was voluntary. Okay. It said if you want to buy into the system and pay the same amount of money that the state pays plus a small administrative fee, we'll let you in. Universal health care at the federal level, who knows what it's going to look like. Uh, we'll be talking about this for the years to come. But essentially you're in favor of it in principle. In principle, I am in favor of universal health care, yes. Okay. We have about 10 minutes left. Mr. Marconi, let's just talk raw politics. You had Judith Friedman, who was the state senator, reasonably popular state senator, mm -hmm. seemed to beat anyone that came up against she was. her. Now she's retiring. Tony Boucher is a very well-known state representative from Wilton, mm -hmm. uh, a known commodity. She has a lot of endorsements, very personable. Yep. What would you say are the chances? What, what's the effect going to be of the presidential election? What, how do you see this? I mean, I, I can anticipate your answer being, oh, yeah, he's going to win. It's going to be great. But really, how do you see it, you know, kind of... Uh, well, I think John, John has to get out there, get his name known, get the recognition, and let people know exactly what his positions are. Does it many come down to rain, name recognition a lot? Uh, well, I, I think it comes down to the issue. I think today, more than ever, people are paying much closer attention uh -huh. to what's going on in their particular area. People are concerned about quality of life. They want to know what's going to be done about the cost of gas, et cetera. A lot of the things that this gentleman here, nor Tony you, Boucher, are going to be able to do you, address. Do you think a little bit, I don't mean to interrupt, but do you think you a little bit, I'm sorry, <laughs> but do you think a little bit that people are a little bit tired of politicians coming on, running for office, and, and promising the sky uh, and the moon and, and not being able to deliver? Well, I, I don't think I hear John promising the sky and the moon. I, I think I hear what he's saying he wants to go to work for. Uh -huh. uh, Health care. Health care is a major issue, has been in this state. Uh, transportation. Transportation a major issue. We have uh, Tony's a wonderful lady. I've known her for a long time, does a good job, but is it time for a change? And I think that's what the theme is throughout our country. We need things to change because the people who have been involved up till now haven't gotten it done. We need to get the improvements made to the Branchville line. We need to see improvements in health care. We need to see a lot of things happen. The real estate taxes, uh, ECS, the educational cost sharing, all that whole system looked at. And it's just not happening. We hear them discuss, the legislature meets, and then the outcome is nothing. And I'm not saying it's Republican or Democrat. I'm saying maybe we need some new people in Hartford. Yeah, it's one thing if you want to hire the new guy, but you might want to fire the old guy. And you're saying there's sentiment out there to fire the old guys. No, I didn't say fire the old guy. I said to the people need to look at the new guy, listen to what his views are, listen to what his ideas are, and then to vote their conscience. Vote for the best person they feel is capable of doing the job they need to have done. If you look at the last presidential election, you'll see that this is a, a district, the 26th senatorial district, yeah. is a district where people think and make up their minds, and they're quite willing to split tickets. Uh -huh. So, in, who did win in the last presidential election? In this district, yeah, John Kerry. Okay. Um, so, if you look in 2004, uh, Judy Friedman carried the district by 10,000 votes uh -huh. as a Republican. Right. Christopher Dodd carried the same set of precincts by 10,000 votes in the other direction. Right. Okay. And in the middle was John Kerry who squeaked through a win. Okay. Chris uh, Shays did better th than that. Uh -huh. but, I mean, he, he, he beat Bush. Right. So people split their tickets. Okay. Now a lot of people voted for Judy Friedman. She'd been in office for 22 years. Or she has been now. At, right. at that time it was 18. Uh, she was well known. I think she was well liked. Um, she's retiring. And uh, I, you know I wish her Godspeed. Uh -huh. uh, this is an open seat. And as you say, Tony's well known, certainly in, in Wilton. I don't think she's as well known in the rest of the district. Uh -huh. And uh, I think both of us have the same burden, which is to get out and become known uh -huh. and let people see what we're talking about. Now, I'm not coming in to promise that you know the Danbury line is going to be fixed or that uh, the main line is going to be fixed. Or, or there's we'll going to be affordable health care. Or affordable, affordable health care. I can promise you that I will work hard every day for those issues uh -huh. and that I will listen carefully to what people have to say and that I will work also across the aisle. I, I salute Governor Rell on campaign finance reform. I salute her on the, on the uh, increase in, in funding for the main line. For the, um, I have significant differences with her on some other issues like health care. Uh -huh. I am certainly willing to work with any Republican uh, who has an idea that's a good idea. That, and, and I'd like to actually end with that because there's, there are too many games going on 
no. in Hartford. There's too much posturing that goes on. Absolutely. And there's and what we need are people who are willing to work. Now, I used to be a banker. Now I'm a consultant. And, and my job as a consultant is to come into an organization. I'm not going to be a specialist in everything. I'm not going to know your organization to begin with. My job is to come in, learn quickly, figure out what's going on, and come up with some solutions and help people find a way forward. And that's what I want to do in Hartford. Okay. Well, I appreciate very much uh, you coming in. We have a few minutes left. Any uh, last questions? Well, you sound like a great candidate. Um, I think one of the things that um, impresses me the most about you, and of course, I've known you for a little while, is that um, I really get annoyed when candidates come out and they promise you all this stuff and they get in the office and they don't do anything. Um, it sounds like you're the type of person that's going to get up there. You're not promising the, you know, the rainbow here, but it seems, sounds like you're the type of person who's going to go up there and try to do your best to represent your district. And I think that's the most important thing because Absolutely. once again, my taxpayers' got dollars are going all up to Hartford, and I'm getting a nickel back on a dollar. I want to know that I'm, I want, I want somebody up there representing my interests. And 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 as Your Marty nickel. pointed out a while <laughs> my ago, nickel. as Marty pointed out a while ago, the, this, the legislature is controlled by the Democrats, and so the yeah. first first step in getting money right. back here is to convince them that that has to happen, and that would be my job number one. Right. Now I know uh, I want to touch on one other little topic. I know it might not have a lot to do with this area, but the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. um, would you have supported Absolutely. overriding the veto? Absolutely. But, you know, a minimum wage is a very blunt instrument. Right. And it does put a burden on small business. And it's not the method that I would prefer. Yeah, that's the reason why I brought it up, because your district, your area that you represent, I would assume most people, most businesses in that area would object to... I think the, small the business people anywhere don't want more regulation and they don't want more mandates from the government. Um, I can understand that. Running a business is a tough job. Um, Milton Freeman, who you may know is a very conservative economist. He's had, Reagan's guy. Exactly. And he had a completely different approach to this same issue. The issue is, how do we put money into the hands of people who are working? And one way to do it is the minimum wage, which says let's take some money out of a business and give it directly to the people who are working. Another way to do it is what's called an earned income tax credit. Right. That was Milton Freeman's way to do it. Right. And he says for everybody who's working and who's paying taxes or who files an income tax statement, mm -hmm. let's make sure that they have enough money to live on. Let's cut them a check if we, next, if we need to. The federal government has this program. It's very successful. Um, it was passed at the state level and vetoed. Uh, it needs to be passed again. An earned income tax credit is the way to go, not a minimum wage. But if I have to have a choice, yes, I would have supported the minimum wage. Okay. And, and I, most of the people in Connecticut do, including most Republicans, actually. If you look at the polls, more than 60% of the Republicans in the state approve of the minimum wage increase. So I think Governor Rell was um, not listening to the people in that, in that situation and should have. Oh, great. Well, I want to thank John Hartwell for joining us this evening. Thank you. I wish you, you uh, all the luck in the world on your campaign. Mr. Marconi, thank you very much for thank coming. Thank you, Mr. Here. Heiser. Can we do the plug for the uh, Oh, please, yes, by all means. Website, I want to get in contact uh, with you. John Hartwell, 2008.com. Okay. Uh, we'll get you there. Even johnhartwell.com will get you to my website. I would uh, ask anyone to come to the website, uh, read what I've got there, and uh, give us some thought. I'd love to meet people, love to talk to them. Google is a beautiful thing. Yes, you it is. You put in Google, and all of a sudden you got <laughs> interviews. Well, I think maybe you would tape them. Uh, you work with uh, uh, Ned Lamont, and right. there's all kinds of information on there. Yep. Good information. Yep. So, I want to thank you very much for coming in, Al Robinson. Again, thanks a lot for uh, coming in. As always. Uh, next week we're going to have John Fry joining us. And by the way, this is a shout out to Die Masters, uh, uh, Mr. Marconi. Maybe you could mention that you were seen recently with Die Masters in this. Uh, Colonial outfit, I think there's one right there. We work together, Marty. You do work together, that's right. Um, yeah, you were seen in the middle of a parade. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't suggest anything other than that. But um, John Fry will be coming in, and uh, and then in uh, two, three weeks, July 31st, he'll be joining us for this sit down debate, which we're excited about. Thanks again for joining. Ideas of Work and Beyond. We'll see you next week, same time, same station. Good evening.